Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and as John Campy likes to call me, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, it's me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and this is the John Campy Show Mailbag for Friday, April 4th, 2022. We've had a few days go by without a mailbag. We've got some great questions from you, as you all know. During the John Campia Show, at the very beginning of the show, you can fire in a super chat that we will read live on the channel during that day's show. But any other time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you can go to our tip link in the description below, and you can send us questions even if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can send us a tip question and we will read it on the mailbag. Either John and I will do it together, or if you're lucky, you'll get me to do it like I'm going to do it right now. So let's just jump right in and see what you have to say. Obi-Wan Theory sends in a tip and says, Hi John, great show. I have a theory about why the Obi-Wan series was moved two days. Celebration is on Thursday and I bet they're going to show the first two episodes to the guests before the official drop as a special treat. Over or under 25% if this is the case. Thanks for the show. You know what, Obi-Wan Theory? That is a good theory. Uh, I think it is a good theory. My only problem with that is that the Star Wars celebration is only here in, in Anaheim, California. Well, what about the rest of the world that has Disney Plus? I mean, I can understand them wanting to do that, but didn't they think about that beforehand? Well, maybe not. You never know how things go. I think it's a good theory, but I can't, I don't know if it's exactly the truth, but it could very well be. Could very well be. Uh, Mark Nadal sends in a tip and says, this week on Hot Ones, Josh Brolin, he was inevitable. Mark, you know what? I love Hot Ones. That show is so good. And I hear that the uh, the new episode with Josh Bullen is great. I have yet to see it, so I really want to see it, uh, but I haven't seen it yet. By the way, if there's some barking going on, you might notice this is uh, the first time that I have done this show in our new digs. I am not in my studio because it has not been set up yet. I'm actually in our family room, so there are pooches running around, so I hope you will and by the way, that is not my TV. That is very little TV. People keep pointing out, you know, Rob, you need a bigger TV. You think that's my TV? That is not. Anyway, um, so I hope you will forgive me if there's any technical difficulties because this is the first time I have broadcast from this place. This mailbag, I mean, this could be the very house I spend the rest of my life in. At least I hope it will be. Please bear with me. Oh, Tallulah, please. Come on now. You can't do that. No. No, Ro sends in a tip and says, John and crew, not sure if it'll be John or Rob reading this. Well, it's me. It is me. <laughs> Tallulah, you got to stop. You got to stop. You want to come up here? You can't bark. Um, it's me. Right? But I was going back through older episodes and came across John giving Collider. Hey, you got to stop. You have to stop barking. You going to come up here? Come up here. Okay, look. Uh, I'll, 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 if you're, you, no, you cannot bark. Uh, this is Tallulah. Tallulah is an Irish doodle, and she is very loquacious. She likes to talk. Come on, man. Tallulah, you, you got to calm down. You, you know, you got to sit for me. Will you sit? Uh, look, you're getting, if nothing else, this is candid and real. So anyway, let's see what uh, Ro says. Ro says, let's get back to Ro. John and crew, not sure if it'll be John or Rob reading this. Well, it's me and apparently Tallulah and Gilbert. But I was going back through older episodes and came across John giving Collider the business when they canceled all the shows. Then the CEO comes on for an interview with John. Laugh out loud, <laughs> savage. Yeah, it was savage. Well, you know, because John was instrumental in starting Collider. I mean, you know, uh, he was at AMC first and then it became Collider when it was bought by Complex. And uh, John couldn't, you know, help but take it personally. I mean, that was something he built. Now he's building this up again. And by the way, for anybody who's paying attention, on April 14th, a mere, what, six days from now, is my actual seventh anniversary uh, of being on YouTube. And the first day I streamed was with the great, late, great John Schnepp and John Campia. So uh, a special thanks or shout out to Mr. Campia himself. Uh, not that he needs me to do it here because we're talking all day long, every day with one another. But if it wasn't for John Campia seven years ago, I would not be here on YouTube. Uh, 
Garden Variety Vagabond sends in a tip and says, Gents, did you see... Tallulah, come on. Did you see the behind-the-scenes interview with Ethan... Tallulah, stop. Am I, am I going to have to stop? You got to stop. Why are you doing this to me? I have to do this. I have to do this. Come on, Tallulah. Let's go try that one more time. Garden Variety Vagabond says, Gents, did you see the behind-the-scenes interview with Ethan Hawke and the directors and writer that talked about the fact that Hawke came up with the opening scene himself when building the character? He brought it to the showrunner who loved it. I did not know that. I think that's amazing. And, you know, I'll tell you something. I mean, Ethan Hawke himself is a writer. He's a novelist. And I think, you know, part of the filmmaking process is it's collaborative. It's very iterative. And when you have collaborators like Ethan Hawke and they come up with ideas, why not use them? Uh, and that's, I, as we all know, I mean, what a great way to open the show. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was a great choice. So congratulations to Mr. Hawk and congratulations and, you know, to Marvel and the showrunners for allowing him to even bring that suggestion up and then utilize it. I mean, to me, when you're working with collaborators that you trust, that's when filmmaking uh, is the best because you can take those ideas and use them and hopefully make something greater than the sum of their parts. That's why having it be a collaborative art form, I think, is so important. Shy Potsy. <laughs> is that a reference to Happy Days? Shy Potsy. Did I just date myself terribly? Hello, John and or Rob. It's me. I recently rewatched the first Ant-Man. Can we take a moment to just appreciate this film? From the cinematography to the story, the way they were able to make such an impactful and action-packed story with an Ant-Man is amazing. Shy Potsy, I agree with you. I think Ant-Man, and to a certain extent Ant-Man and the Wasp, but Ant-Man itself is probably the most unsung of the MCU movies. Really great, great stuff. And so much fun. And, you know, it, 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 I mean, the fact that it ends in a little girl's bedroom uh, with that, with that toy train chase, I mean, I thought it was inspired. What a great film. Uh, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. I, you and I, we park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. CC, or CC says, hey, John, your show got me through law school. And given the time difference between the U.S. and New Zealand, the John Campy show airing super early for me if I catch it live, by catching it live, you helped me get up early and accompanied, accompanied me throughout my studies. Thank you. Well, kia ora. And uh, kia ora, mate. E uh, tia I am a huge fan of New Zealand. I have obviously lived there for a number of years working on both Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, loved New Zealand so much. Congratulations for getting through law school. You know, John studied law for a while. So um, uh, it's a great feat. So nicely done. And I'm glad we were able to accompany you. Hope I hope uh, it worked well. Zuki sends in a tip and says, Do you think House of the Dragon can reach Game of Thrones level success again? I can't wait for that show. Well, I would hope. I mean, hope springs eternal. I You know, HBO... Um, George R. R. Martin is is at least tangentially involved. I'm hoping it's going to be great. Um, I really do because I love. I, I mean, seven season seven and eight uh, were were not as great as we would have wanted them to be. But I think House of the Dragon looks very cool. I like the idea of the Targaryen civil war, and of course, dragons. What's not to love? Andrew Fitzwater sends in a tip, tip and says, "Hey, John and or Rob." Thanks for all that you guys do. Well, you're welcome. At the end of this month, Netflix is releasing the final episodes of their longest running show, Grace and Frankie. Seven years, almost 100 episodes. Have you ever watched it? And what are your thoughts? Well, it's, of course, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. I've watched it. Andrew, I haven't watched it regularly, but Elizabeth, the lady of my life, she watches the show and I've watched it with her. I think they're incredibly talented performers. And I, I love the fact that it's gone seven years it'll probably be the i believe it's the final season but kudos to them i mean two of the great actresses of the 20th century and of course lily tomlin is one of the great comedians and comic writers of uh of the 20th and now 21st century so it's great to see them together i'm glad the show had this much success and it just goes to show you it doesn't matter how old you get you never have to stop working never 
Uh, Jacob Olbert, one of five. Wow, Jacob, all right. Hi, guys. So after 16 long years, I rewatched The Godfather for your movie club. And even though I really loved the film, I didn't have as strong a connection as the first time I watched it. Maybe because at the same time of my first watch, I played the PlayStation 2 video game adaptation, which filled in some gaps in the plot. Now, if you can, try the game. It's really great. I have the game, and I need to find it to give it to, to uh, Ray. He's, he's killing me. Now comes a bit of controversy. Godfather 2. Didn't really appeal to me, and I found it unnecessarily complicated, or maybe I'm too stupid. And since I've always heard many negatives to The Godfather 3, I've never seen it until now as part of the whole trilogy. But there is a catch. I went straight to Godfather Coda, the death of Michael Corleone, and I really liked it. Not, of course, as much as the original, but definitely more than the second movie. Wow. I know I'll probably be in the minority with this opinion, but hey, as you say, every movie is objective. Actually, it's subjective. I think they're objective. Now, I have a question for Rob. How different is the original Godfather 3 compared to Coda, and which of these two versions do you prefer? Thanks for the great work, and my favorite gangster film of all time is still Scarface. Say hello to my little friend. P.S. John, did you finish Dexter New Blood? I believe he did not. Uh, if yes, what are your thoughts on the finale? Well, first of all, so, so basically, the real difference with Godfather... Uh, part three is that the uh, coda introduces the uh, when he's talking to the banker from the Vatican Bank when when Michael Corleone is talking to the Vatican Bank. So it really sets up the idea that he's being honored by the church because he's willing to bail the church out. So structurally, it's a little different. It doesn't just open with the party, which was the same way that Godfather One and Godfather Two opened with parties. I mean, it goes there later. But it does begin with the father, the, the Vatican banker, talking to Michael Corleone. And that's what sort of sets off the plot. And I think it, it, it sort of solidifies the actual story of how Michael was able to make his bid to go legitimate. Um, and also at the end of the movie, you don't see him fall out of his chair. Like in the original version of Godfather 3, and the extended version, he kind of falls out of his chair and it looks a little comical. And in Coda, it just kind of fades out. And I, I have to say, I'm a fan of Godfather 3. Uh, I really am. I think it's a, a, a movie that, as they said on The Sopranos once, and Godfather 3, it's just misunderstood. I, I, I really enjoy the film quite a bit. Um, you know, I... I Obviously, my problems with Godfather 3 are, I don't think Sofia Coppola at the time, she stepped in for Winona Ryder, who was exhausted at the time, and she'd just been working so much, she was supposed to play his daughter originally, but couldn't do it. And then um, the Andy Garcia character I like, but their romance, Sofia Coppola not being as strong of an actress as say Winona Ryder was, it's not as good as it probably should be, unfortunately. So I think their romance is a little underdeveloped, and um, and I think that that's what really hampers the film. But I there's a lot of it that I love. I would never say it's better than Godfather Two. Godfather and Godfather Two are my two of my favorite films of all time. But um, I still love Godfather Three. And the idea that not only is he trying to go legitimate, but he's also trying to redeem himself. But the thing is, Michael Corleone killed his own brother, ordered his own brother to be killed. He lost his soul. And, and the cost that he has to pay is the death of his daughter. And I, I think all of that works beautifully. Uh, it's just not as effective as the first two movies. People forget, though, that Godfather 3 did also get nominated for Best Picture. So, yes, it did. But great questions, Jacob. Uh, great questions. Dangerous D. Says, hi, John and Rob. I heard you want to rename your show, and if you want suggestions, may I suggest Bring on the Filthy or Bring on the Filthy, B-O-T-F or Bring on the Filthy. You can interchange the F to film or fun. Bring on the topic. What do you think? Well, I, I don't want to speak for John. I think here the idea is we're trying to elevate the channel, so maybe it'll get big enough that one day somebody would actually acquire us, perhaps, kind of like Discovery is acquiring Warner Brothers. So I think we need a more generic name. Um, 
I love bring on the filthy. Actually, I think bring on the topic is not a bad idea. I like where you're going with that, but I I think we have to we have to maintain a veneer of uh, respectability. And some people might not quite understand the joy of saying bring on the filthy. Wit Wiki, I love that name, says, "Hey John and Rob, <coughs> it's me or both John and Rob. I was just rewatching the Amazing Spider-Man two. And I came to the realization that this might be the best looking comic book movie ever made. Every frame looks beautiful and alive. There's just something special about it. Witwicky, totally agree with you. Um, and it looks like a comic book. It's beautiful like a comic, very vibrant. But to me, I prefer, I like a more realistic. I mean, it's interesting because I think the MCU is a toned down version of what Raimi's doing. That's why I'm really interested to see what Raimi is doing with Multiverse of Madness. Are they gonna kind of keep that neutral, real world MCU aesthetic? Or are they gonna push it more toward the vibrant colors? Because the multiverse, you can do a lot more, a lot more with the colors. It's gonna be really interesting to see which direction they go in. And, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Amazing Spider-Man 2, it does look fantastic. And it's, I mean, it's pretty great. Uh, Royce Freeman, Royce Freeman. Um, Royce Freeman says Tarantino has said that he writes his scripts more like novels with dialogue only in script format and he adapts his scenes on set as he shoots this must be hard for production planning not knowing what will be done this day on set thoughts mm, I can't speak to that that might be something that he wants to do but I'm not entirely sure that's the way he does it. Because here's the thing, when you're making a film, uh, a script is all important for everyone else working on that film. All the department heads need the scripts, the art department, uh, the, the, the camera team, everybody needs to know so they know exactly what they're shooting. So, um, I mean, dialogue only, the problem is you need scene descriptions so everybody knows what to do. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know if that's the case. And maybe he just explains that in production meetings. But I'll tell you something. When you're prepping a movie, you do what's called a page turn. And all the department heads sit around a table. And they literally read the script from beginning to end. And anybody who has questions about what appears like, okay, you're in a room. What's in the room? What kind of a room is it? What kind of furniture is in it? Is it an old room? Is it a new room? And everybody has to be on the same page. That's why description in the scripts is so important. So uh, it's hard to say. I, I can't really speak to that exactly, Royce, but um, it, that might be the case. Simon says, I am so happy that Rob and I finally got to see the completed version of Star Trek The Motion Picture via Paramount+. Plus. It is the closest to Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek. I would delight in hearing Rob's impressions of the Strange New Worlds trailer. Well, first of all, Simon, you and I definitely park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. I loved, I saw it on the Paramount lot on the gigantic screen with a thunderous sound system. It was amazing. There's a few nitpicks and a few things that I, I would correct if possible. But for the most part, I, I think that the movie acquitted itself admirably. I think anybody that calls it the motionless picture, the slow motion picture, should watch this new version. I absolutely agree with you. It is the most Roddenberry-esque of all of the Star Wars movies. Did I say Star Wars? I just did. See, see, my mind of the Star Trek movies. It's my favorite Star Trek film. I think Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II is a better movie, but Star Trek The Motion Picture is my favorite. Q John, John Campy going, well, wait a minute, best and favorite? Anyway, I don't want to get into that debate. Now, Strange New Worlds. I am cautiously optimistic. You know, when I see things, I, I think that there is still a, when I watched Star Trek as a kid growing up, I took it seriously. And sometimes the show had comedic episodes like Trouble with Tribbles or A Piece of the Action or Shore Leave, even though Shore Leave had very serious moments. The tone of this movie is more, gar or the tone of Strange New Worlds feels more like Guardians of the Galaxy, which is not as Star Trek as I want it to be, but there's a lot of good stuff in it. So I'm going to remain cautiously optimistic. I mean, I like Anson Mount as Pike. I'm a little concerned that they lean back on a lot of the secondary characters that were from Next Generation, 
came like the original. Pardon me. Lean on the secondary characters that were from the original series. My mind's all over the place because I'm thinking Picard, Strange New Worlds. It's like I'm a man floating a different time. So I'm cautiously optimistic. We'll see. We'll see. But remember, I'm very critical. Maybe to my detriment. Connor Thorne says, do you guys plan on reviewing comedy movies on Movie Club? I think we should. Um, you know, we've talked about doing like 40-year-old virgin. I'd love to do some more classic comedies. But really, it's really interesting because obviously we do Movie Club to get people to watch it. And our views are really dependent on the movies that we choose. So it's tough. Like, I, 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 I wonder what comedies... I mean, I think if we did more modern comedies like 40-Year-Old Virgin, we would probably get more people to watch. But I'm sure we're going to do that. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, again, John's a big comedy guy, and it'll be interesting to see what uh, he decides to do. But I guarantee you we will do comedies. I just don't know when. Uh, Albert J. Gonzalez Jr., one of two. Hey, John Campia team. I have to say I am loving your movie club videos so much. It encourages me to revisit some amazing movies and catch things I never caught before. It also gives me a chance to get new experience with these movies and have new opinions. Well, Albert J. Gonzalez Jr., there's nothing better for us than to hear you say something like that. I love hearing that. Uh, I totally agree with you. I love going back and doing it. You know, going back and watching movies and then talking about it, you do get new insights, especially if time has gone by since I, we've seen movies. You know, as you move through life, you get different opinions about things. So, and I really enjoy, I mean, I love being in that room with John and Ray and, and Ray cracks me up, but it's also fun because a lot of these movies Ray hasn't seen. And I really love hearing what his takes on these are, like seeing them for the first time. What do they mean to him? What does he take away from it? And uh, I'm really enjoying that. And of course, I love hearing where John's coming from too. Because, you know, a lot of the time we, we talk about modern entertainment news, but we don't, we don't talk a lot about what we thought of classic cinema like that we grew up with. So I think Movie Club is great for that. So I agree with you. Let's see what your second part of your question is, Albert. This makes me think of movie reviews for new movies. Do you think it's fair to review a movie that you have seen only once? Would you agree that your review for a movie changes after seeing it multiple times? Thank you all. Well, Albert, great insight. Uh, I think it does. But here's the thing. I also think that the first time you see a movie, the first time it hits you, the, the wave of the movie as it rolls over you, I think that uh, it's important that that first impression is also equally valuable. Now, I found that I, I don't really appreciate movies as, as much as I want to until I've watched them more than even two or three times. The, my favorite movies I'll watch over and over again and you return to them as the years go by. So I think that, um, yeah, I think as you watch movies over and over again, it changes. But I do think <clears throat> the first time you see a movie, because look, let's face it, a lot of the time we're only gonna see movies once. And the way they initially hit us, that's absolutely very valid. But really interesting questions. Thanks for that, Albert. Dangerous D comes back and says, Hey, John and Rob, I listen to your opinions or options. I listen to your options regarding the Ezra Miller situation and what should Warner Brothers do? Should they fire him or do nothing? Well, I have a third opinion. Do a Doctor Who and change the ending of the movie somehow. Barry's face is changed because of Flashpoint. Um, hmm. You know, I, I mean, look, they probably, or maybe will never get another Flash movie. So I, I think they should just go with what was shot. I never think it's a good idea to change a movie based on damage control. We saw it with all the money in the world when Kevin Spacey was replaced with Christopher Plummer. They didn't replace uh, Army Hammer in uh, Death on the Nile, um, which I think was probably a good thing. But, um, you know, I never think that whatever happens in the real world, you should, you should make the film and keep it as true to itself as possible. At least that's kind of the way I think about it. Zampras says, Hi, John. Longtime fan since the AMC days. I noticed that you wrote to your contact regarding the Flash situation. Have you checked with the same source if we're getting a Henry Cavill Superman Man of Steel 2? I'm a huge fan of Man of Steel. I need Superman. Well, Zampras, as you know, John and I are both huge fans of Henry Cavill, and we love him as the Man of Steel. 
I think it's a crying shame. Even if they announced a Man of Steel movie today, it would have been 10 years since we got the first one. I'm a huge fan. I want to see it get made, but I don't think John checked with our source about this. But know then that we both would love to see it as you would. So Zampras, we're on the same page. Chloe Fanning sends in a tip and says, theoretically speaking, could Warner Brothers sue Ezra Miller basically taking back his paycheck for the Flash movie? Good question. If they deemed his actions did hurt the Flash movie, even though history has shown that WB will not sue, but could it possibly happen theoretically? Well, theoretically, I'd say, Chloe, yes. There are damages there. And if the thing is, if you're going to sue somebody, the big thing is in court, you have to prove that there are damages involved. Now, if the movie comes out, which it doesn't come out for another year, but if it does come out, and there's all this, if Ezra Miller doesn't clean up his act, and there's all this bad press around the film, and uh, there's a demonstrable box office effect that they blame him for, they absolutely could go after him and sue him for their money back. But they wouldn't get enough back to cover. I mean, you could, you could talk, they might be losing tens of millions of dollars. And he doesn't have that kind of money, and so is it really worthwhile? Whenever you're going to sue somebody for damages, you have to think, well, one, can you prove the damages? And two, if you do prove damages, are you going to get enough out of that suit that it's worth, worth your while? And that's, uh, that's certainly a tough call. Interesting question, though. Joseph, or, or no, Jans, Janzoff? Is it Janzoff? Janzoff says, hi, Rob. I'm a Star Trek fan, too. Good man or good woman or good person. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I don't know by that name. I think I got it right. Is it, is it Janzoff? Janzoff? It's like Joseph, but Janzoff? Um, please do Movie Club with one of the Star Trek movies. My favorites are Ratha Khan, Voyage Home, and First Contact. Would love to see what everyone else thinks of them. I would love... Well, I think, we, I think the best Movie Club Star Trek movie we should do is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. I think it has the broadest appeal. I don't think Ray Ora has seen it. And I think we'd get a great discussion out of it. So I would love to do that. And, and I have to say, clearly you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. So it's really up to John, but we shall see. I think that we should. Dr. Nova, shout out to Event Cinemas, one 15 minute uh, events. Shout out to Event Cinemas, 15 minute ads, VMAX, 12 minutes, gold class, three trailers, two ads. At the end of the movie, a person stands at the entrance holding a rubbish bag open. They show classic movies monthly. Lights are on when the trailers are playing. Surprisingly helpful. That sounds great. Where is Event Cinemas? Uh, that sounds good. They know what's up. They're not making you sit there forever. I like the fact that they're taking their viewers into consideration. I love that. Devin says, hey, John. With what you've seen in Top Gun and what you know about Doctor Strange ahead of both release, releases, which one are you most excited for and why? P.S. Congrats on the new studio. Also, your show is therapy for me. Well, Devin, first of all, I like the fact that you consider our show therapy, but I want to say that neither John or I are licensed therapists. So, you know, um, as long as we're helping you and you take something out of it, I love hearing that. But good questions. I have to say, look, a Top Gun, and John's seen more of it than I have because he saw it at CinemaCon last year. To me, Top Gun looks amazing. I can't even believe that they made Top Gun 2, to be honest. I, 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 I'm like, really? Um, but it's a different experience for me. I mean, I'm a huge MCU fan. Doctor Strange looks bonkers. I don't know what's going to happen. How does it relate to the larger MCU? How are they going to explain mutants? What's going to happen with Wanda Maximoff? A lot of questions. But with Top Gun, it's a different experience. I don't... I don't have expectations. I hope it's not. I hope it's not like Wall Street. Money never sleeps. The Wall Street sequel they made a lot. lot I mean, they made that what ten years ago or something. I hope this is better than that. But I'm really looking forward to Top Gun. But I'm, I'm looking forward. I have to say, what am I looking forward to more? Probably Doctor Strange, only because I've got more of a connection to it. But that's not to say I'm not really looking forward to Top Gun Maverick because I am. I am. Tyler C. says, Good morning, crew. The first reviews for Robert Eggers, The Northman, are out, and they're overwhelmingly good. 
There is praise for the story as well as Alexander Skarsgård for an outstanding performance. What are your thoughts on the reviews coming out? Well, Tyler, we talked about this the other day on the show. I am deliriously excited for seeing The Northman because on one hand, I know it's going to be a very evocative period piece. Robert Eggers is, I mean, he knows how to cast a mood. But to know that it is a straight-up, in-your-face revenge thriller where dudes are going to get chopped in half with battle axes and all that, bring it on, man. Bring it on. And that the carnage is going to be drenched in blood and it's going to be beautifully photographed. I can't wait. Very, very excited. And I think it's going to be, if not the best movie of the year, certainly right up there. I'm a huge Robert Eggers fan, so bring it on. Ruben W. says, hey, John and crew, do you think Warner Brothers will hope the Oscars incident, along with other current world events, overlook the Ezra Miller situation? I like Miller's take on The Flash, but I also believe in accountability, and Warner Brothers are flaky and inconsistent. Look, I think Ezra Miller's going through some stuff. I think he's got issues. Clearly, he's got some, some mental issues. Again, I haven't diagnosed him. I'm not a doctor. But he's had a number of incidents over the last year, and I have also heard, I have it on very reliable authority, that on set, the, the, the Thor, or Thor, the Flash set was more troubled than we uh, have been told. And a lot of that just comes right down to Ezra Miller, and that's not good for anyone. So clearly, he needs to get some help. And I hope he gets the help that he needs. Because I like you, I'm a huge fan of Ezra Miller. I loved him in Perks of Being a Wallflower. I loved him in We Have to Talk About Kevin. And I really love him as the Flash. So I, I want to see Ezra Miller uh, get past all this. I really do. I really do. Uh, Devin says, Episode 2 of Moon Knight was great. Definitely had a good amount of small comedic moments like Marvel is good at. Pacing I thought was good. I cried when Mr. Knight could barely stick the landing, the, the last minute superhero landing. Can't wait to see more. Got my Doctor Strange ticks. Fire! Well, Devin, as you know, I mean, I'm the Moon Knight guy. And seeing Moon Knight, I loved episode two of Moon Knight. I thought it was dope. Um, it was really amazing. And look, I'm really liking the series. It wasn't the Moon Knight that I fell in love with. I don't even want to tell you how long ago. That's how old I am. But I like this is kind of an amalgamation of various takes on Moon Knight put together in a blender. And of course... Going forward, people are going to see this as the definitive take on Moon Knight. I mean, for me, Moon Knight was much more like a 40s noir vibe, kind of like what the new The Batman is, what um, Matt Reeves' The Batman is. That was more along the lines of the Moon Knight that I loved. But then, you know, Moon Knight had kind of an identity problem. Everybody, the different writing teams that came on did different things with him. I mean, the whole thing about disassociative identity disorder... Um, there was, there was, Brian Bendis wrote a, 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 um, a run on that book where Moon Knight believed he was Wolverine. I mean, it was, that was very different than what I uh, grew up with. But still, the show's great. It's really well made. It's very cinematic. I love Oscar Isaac. I love Handsome Hawk. I mean, I think that the show's going to be really special. Special. Can't wait to see where it goes. And where it goes, I, I don't know. You know, I really don't. I, I it's, I'm, um, I'm curious. Where's it all gonna go? Doctor Nova's back. Aliens. Weaver's agent read that, and it was announced in the paper that she told him to wait. Sets were being built. Other people were cast, and then at some point, someone said, "Wait, did anyone tell Sigourney Weaver?" Then she got a call and said, "Interesting. Pay me." Well, Sigourney Weaver is a very smart lady, so it doesn't surprise me that that's exactly what happened absolutely 100 percent um and you know what it ain't show friends it's show business so good on her uh love that story uh my name jeff one of four at the end of the opening credits of godzilla versus kong it shows the other titans rodan Scylla, behemoth etc in a sort of titan tournament it labels all Titans except Godzilla and Kong as defeated. It's understandable if you think they are all dead. This, however, is not true. They are still alive and well. Notice in the opening credits, when you see the Titans right before the movie title comes up, Ghidorah's picture is the only one that says deceased next to it. The other files just say defeated. 
What they meant by defeated was when Rodan and the others bowed to Godzilla in King of the Monsters. That's when they were defeated. The novelization also tells us what they were doing. They're dormant during the movie, for instance. Rodan is nesting near Mount Fuji. I didn't know that. But you know what? Kaijus never die. You know, they just get reconstituted or come back. Um, so, but I like what you're saying there. Um, I never thought that they were completely gone. Because are they really ever gone? I don't think so. And look, I'm a huge fan of, of King of the Monsters. I love that movie more than I think most people did. I really, really enjoyed it. You can see on my own show, Rob's Observations, I did a, a very, I was waxing rhapsodic about it. I'm a big fan, so I like that. I mean, I don't, I don't think they're dead. I never thought they were dead. Um, and then Jeff goes on to say his fourth, uh, fourth is, anyway, now you know what happens to the other Titans. I'm a huge Monsterverse fan, so I just wanted to tell you this in case you wondered. Thanks for all the great work. Well, Jeff, I'm a huge, not just this Monsterverse, but I, all, I go all the way back to the Showa era of Godzilla films, the original era. But I have to say, my favorite kaiju movie of all growing up, uh, Kaiju uh, Rodan, the first, the first Rodan movie. I loved it. It was more like a horror film than a kaiju movie. I loved it, loved it, loved it. So that's my favorite, but I, you know, I love them all. Even something like Godzilla's Revenge, or Godzilla Rides Again, or whatever. I mean, even the movies that aren't great. Um, you know, I've watched Godzilla versus Megalon because I was a kid. It was on TV more times than I care to care to admit. I mean, Jet Jaguar. Come on. Even though Jet Jaguar is a total Ultraman ripoff or whatever, I still loved it. Still loved it. Uh, Alan Gonzalez says, "Hi, John and crew. I was thinking." Don't the theaters have the studios in a position if the theaters wanted to get a higher cut per movie, they would be able to get it? What would the studios do if they don't have where to play big budget movies? Thanks. Well, the studios now have streaming services. And while we've talked a lot about that on this show, look, I think it you're leaving money on the table if you don't release big budget films in the theater. I mean, whether it's 50 million, 100 million, 200 million, 400 million, or two billion you're always leaving money on the table if you don't open theatrically and a hit theatrically or even a, any kind of a theatrical release brings you a prestige uh your to your project like you know that okay it opened theatrically it's important for industry perception and things like that i'm a big proponent of theatrical so is john uh to not send out these big tent poles theatrically but your question is can movie theaters hold the studios up no because the movie theaters need the studio's tent poles more than studios need movie theaters to exhibit the films. The studios can call the shots because they're the suppliers, whereas the movie theaters, they, they, they really can't uh, call the shots. You know what I mean? So, but it's a good question. Luke the Light sends in a tip and says, I wasn't stoked about the costume design for the Batman when initial photos leaked. But it grew on me, and after seeing the movie, I have to say it's one of my favorite versions of the costume alongside Keaton's. What's your favorite live-action bat suit? You know, I do love Keaton's suit, but it just, you, you can't move in it. I gotta probably go with the, uh, and, and I thought that in, in Batman Begins, Christian Bale had that same problem. It was that full-on rubber suit. I think in The Dark Knight, it felt the most functional to me of all the Batman costumes, and he, he basically is using the same costume in both Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. So I think that's my favorite. Although I gotta tell you, I really do love Ben Ben Affleck's suit with the gray and the black uh, in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Real big fan of that suit. So that's um, I don't know if I have a favorite though. I think if I had to pick, maybe it'd be Affleck. I think. Maybe. Although don't quote me on that. Uh, Captain Timothy Adams sends in a tip and says, Miracle Workers, Season 4 and the Orville Season 3, which one are you most excited for? Game Day, Moonlight, and Halo. Well, Captain Timothy Adams, mm, look, I, I'm looking forward to uh, Orville. I think it's going to be great. And to be honest, I, I haven't seen Miracle Workers, so I can't, I can't like anticipate it yet. But I absolutely would uh watch both but i think it's the orville for me and uh yeah why not because i love the orville 
Miguel Sosa Myers sends in a tip and says, love the show, guys. Love Ray on the show, don't we? Don't we all love Ray on the show? Ray Ora, he is a treasure. Controversial take, but I actually prefer DC films over Marvel. I don't know why, but The Suicide Squad, The Batman and Joker, Man of Steel, all are films based on comic lore that expand the genre, in my opinion. Love you guys. Well, Miguel Sosa Myers, I think you have a good point there. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has created this universe that all the films fit into. But the movies you mentioned, whether it's The Batman, Joker, Man of Steel, those are all tourist visions where the directors can create something on their own. And it's a different, it's a different kind of an experience. So I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I am a firm believer in, I, I don't know, it depends what you want. I think as individual films, but I look, I think I love Infinity War and Endgame. I love Winter Soldier. But I do think like Man of Steel and The Batman feel more fulfilling, maybe from an intellectual and film-going standpoint, I guess, maybe. Um, but I can, you know, I don't think you need to apologize. I think like the comics, DC films are giving you something different for your soul, and that's okay. Ted Williams sends in a tip and says, Hey, John and Rob, absolutely love your show. Been listening since day one. I was wondering what you guys thought of Wanda saying that she has the same nightmare. Is this Marvel alluding to the main villain being Nightmare from the comics? Ooh, I don't think so. I think they both are probably having nightmares about dying. And they're, they're, they're actually, the nightmares are actually them witnessing their characters dying in the multiverse. At least that's what my initial, uh, I would initially suspect that. Don't know if it's true, but but it would be kind of awesome if it was. Um, but I think that's, it means they've been having the same nightmare, probably their own demise. Uh, John Davidian says, since Flash is a multiverse film with multiple Barry Allens and timelines, why doesn't WB just redo the last one third or so of the film to introduce a new Flash? Maybe Ezra dies. It, um, well, we'll come back to it. Uh, I don't know what the it is. Um, oh, oh, there, the it is right there. Maybe Ezra dies. It could be a way to recast the role without losing everything they've shot. Could be, I look, I don't think that they're going to recast. I think they're, they're, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. I think the best way is to get Ezra Miller some help. He can go into some therapy thing or rehab or get on the right medication or whatever. He comes back and he apologizes, throws himself on the mercy of the court and says, I'm sorry, I messed up. Um, because to reshoot things in a movie, it's not as easy as it might seem. It, it can cost, especially on a studio movie, tens of millions of dollars to do that. And then who are you going to get to play the role? And what are you going to do when the movie comes out? Who's going to do press? It could turn into a real nightmare very, very quickly. Uh, Dance Wizard. Dance Wizard Media says, Hi, John and crew. I just got my Multiverse of Madness ticket in Dublin, in Dublin, in Dolby this morning, and I'm super excited. Also, I got a double feature for Sonic 2 and Everything Everywhere this weekend. Man, it's a good month for movies. Love the show. You guys are awesome. No, Dance Wizard Media, you, you are awesome. Well, thanks for writing in. Appreciate that. Appreciate the support. Um, Sonic 2 and Everything Everywhere, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a, that's a good, as they call it, media diet. Well done. I appreciate that. Uh, it is a good month for movies, and I can't wait to see Everything Everywhere. And, you know, you've still got Winning Time, which isn't a movie, but it's a series on HBO. And I implore everyone, watch a little Tokyo Vice. Michael Mann back directing TV. Looks really good. I read the original book is based on, so I think that's going to be good. I'm glad you love the show. It is a good month for movies, Dance Wizard Media. Lando, my God, Lando Calrissian watches this show. Lando, with all the talk about the Egyptian deity, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the Wakandan deity uh, Bast Bastet also derived from one of the nine deities? It might, yeah, Lady Bast? Yeah, yes, you are correct about that. Ooh. Lando, I think you're onto something there. Definitely onto something. I love that. Moon Knight Theory says, Hi, John and Rob. My theory on Moon Knight. Arthur is not real, but everything we see of Arthur... Uh, Arthur's not real, but everything we see of Arthur, but really it's another Oscar Isaac as another personality. This would be all in his head and would be interesting. Thoughts? 
Thanks for all you do. Bring on the filthy. Well, Moon Knight Theory, you and I clearly park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay because I've been saying something along these lines that we're going to find out. The rug is going to be pulled out from under us. And I think you might be right about that. I don't know the details or exact, but I think you're definitely barking up the right tree. I will see. Can't wait to see it. Uh, Slick Saturn says, after the Batman, do you see Matt Reeves becoming a new household name? Will his films now draw a crowd like Nolan or Peel, a uh, Nolan or Peel project? Quite personally, I believe he has always delivered from Let Me In to the Apes films and now this. Cheers. Slick Saturn and I agree with you. I think Matt Reeves is one of the best directors working now. He's great with franchise properties. Give him Star Trek, for God's sake, please. Um, I think you're right. I think he's incredibly talented. I've really liked a lot of his work. I liked his two Planet of the Apes movies. I wanted to make more Batman, because who doesn't? Uh, but I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Casey McNatt, one of three. Hey, John and crew. Well, like I said in your last live show, I went to the movies and gave Morbius a chance. To be honest, I found it not that bad, but it was no great movie. But the only nitpick I had was with the end credits, and I continue to question... Uh, it says anonymous, but I still think this is Casey McNatt. Uh, and I continue to question, what the hell is Sony doing? Overall, I might give Morbius a 6 out of 10 despite that end credits. I also saw Sonic 2 tonight, and I gotta say this movie exceeded my expectations. Really love the hell out of this movie, and I can't wait to actually see it again. One last point I wanted to touch on today. What are your thoughts on the Outer Range Amazon series trailer? Overall, I think it looks interesting, even though I still don't know what it's going to be about. Well, Anonymous, first of all, I think the Outer Range series looks amazing. There might be satanic cults, there might be UFOs, there might be the devil, who knows? But I love this combination of horror iconography, sci-fi iconography, and a Western, and there's some sinkhole to hell in the middle of their pasture. I love it. I think that all of that is so, so great. There was an old movie in the 70s. I think it was a TV movie that was about, there was a hole in the ground. Rod Serling hosted. I forget what it was called, but um, I, I think it's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think it looks really, really, really great. But as for what Sony's doing, look, I agree with you. The problem with Sony is they don't have a Kevin Feige. They're making these movies. I mean, each movie is a thing unto itself. They're, they're not paying much attention to how it all works together. And I think that that's a real problem. But then again, studios aren't built to have people like that. Kevin Feige is a complete anomaly in Hollywood. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. Now, um, somebody asked, you know what, I just realized, somebody asked back here about the, um, the Ring of Power, the Amazon series, what I thought the Ring of Power looked like, and I can't find it. Um, oh, okay, it was, it was part of your question here. As you know, I worked on the Lord of the Rings extended versions, and I, well, the first two, I I want it to be good. Again, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt. But again, the problem with a lot of these franchise properties is that modern creators are always trying to change them and make them, I don't know what. Like you either adapt the source material. Tolkien is so beloved. His work has been studied so much that you either adapt it the way it's written or don't do it at all. But I hope, again, Hope Springs Eternal, they're spending a lot of money on it. It looks a little weird. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the choices they're making, but I hope it's great. I really do. I want it to be good. I want it to be great. Um, if it's not good, that's no good for anybody. Loki's Luscious Locks sends in a tip and says, Hey, John and crew, I had an idea. What if the reason Thor, the Thor 4 trailer isn't out yet is because Moon Knight hasn't finished yet? Are we going to see Egyptian gods in Thor 4? Ooh. We already know Zeus is in there. Maybe Gore is the one who killed Ahmet. Thoughts? <whistles> Loki's luscious locks. I like this idea. I think you're definitely onto something. That's why the trailer, we have to see Moon Knight finish. Because maybe Gore the God Butcher kills some of the pantheon of gods from here. Like the Egyptian gods. Ooh, I love this idea. Um, I don't know if it's true, but I do like the idea. And um, I think you probably got some truth in there somewhere so i'm in count me in lights system sends in a tip and says hi john and company we're a did system so we've been interested in the moon Knight show wild to see what they get right and wrong and take liberties with the mirror thing gave me laughs said you don't know about uh did so if you want some info we'd be happy to help 
well light systems uh did i will pass that information along to john and i uh, will look into did systems that's uh that's interesting i don't quite know what that is but um hey if it's lighting you can always you can never know enough about lighting sam sends in a tip and says hey john and crew thanks for all you do on Cinema Blend, I saw that Jurassic World Dominion has a reported runtime of 146 minutes. I know a runtime doesn't determine if a film is good or not, but I was curious, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it sounds like, I mean, what, it's almost an hour and a half or two and a half hours. Look, I hope it's great. I just want to see dinosaurs running around the real world and killing and eating as many people as they can. Um, so it sounds good to me. Bring it on. Make it loud. Um... And what are my thoughts on it? I mean, I think that, I think that there's probably a lot of story there that needs to be told, and um, they're going to probably probably try and do it. So I'm there for it. I mean, more more time of dinosaurs killing killing people that deserve it. Love it, love it. Russell uh, Amador says, "Hey John, the trend is shown for showtimes are getting earlier and earlier for Thursday premieres, such as Doctor Strange, with the earliest being at 3 p.m. Central Time." Do you foresee one day them starting at noon or heck even now at 10 p.m. on Wednesdays? I can, but look, if people are going to show up and go and fill those screenings, why not do it? I mean, they just they want to make the most money they can, so I'm I'm a big fan. I I know it's getting earlier and earlier, but I have no no problem with what they're doing. Hey, if they want to get paid more, who am I to say no? Sean T says, hey crew, I recently re-watched the Godfather, good man, Godfather movies after movie club, along with Coppola's commentary. Have you guys got any recommendations for good commentary tracks? Also, Godfather Part 2 for movie club soon? Thanks and keep up the good work. Well, Sean, oh, commentaries, I mean, I'm a huge fan of all David Fincher's commentaries when he's got them on uh, on uh, his discs. I love Steven Soderbergh commentaries. I love Kurt Russell and John Carpenter on the, I think it's the Escape from New York commentary. It might be the Thing commentary. Uh, I love John Milius and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger on the Conan the Barbarian trilogy, trilogy commentary. It's getting late. I'm very tired. Um, yeah, those are just some. I'm, I'm a huge commentary fan, so yeah. Uh, this one comes from Dennis. Hey, John and gang, I didn't know if you guys knew this, but in Moon Knight, if you scan the QR code, that is in each episode, it will link to a free digital issue of a Moon Knight comic. Every week is a new one. Gotta love Marvel Easter eggs. Yeah, I heard that, Dennis. I think we heard that today on the show. I think that's very, very cool. The question that I have for you, Dennis, is are you using those codes, downloading those comics, and reading them? And if so, what do you think of the Moon Knight comics? Which era are you reading? Who is the writer, artist, team? Love to hear from you. Sea Monkey, one of two, uh, says, I just caught your Dark Knight movie club. So fun. Two things from the movie. One, Joker Truck originally says laughter is the best medicine, but he adds a red painted S in front of the laughter. Uh, two, during the bank heist, after the clowns get electrocuted scene, uh, later a few clowns start arguing in the foreground, but way back you see one of the clowns with tennis shoes never on his hands, nervously touching the safe. Never noticed these details before. Ooh, that's interesting. I, I haven't either. I love that idea. I love when you go back and you see these kinds of movies and there's all these details. You're like, wait a minute. I didn't see that. Um, that's really interesting. Now, now I, see, whenever somebody sends questions like this, I'm like, oh, well, now I've got to go back in and, and watch the movie again to see what you mean, which is one of the things we do on Movie Club. But I love when you guys send us those kinds of things. Sean. Sean sends in a tip and says, hey, John. I think some people are overlooking a major point in episode two of Moon Knight. Mark's wife mentioned that he is not speaking to his mother at the moment. Steven's reaction to this was a puzzled look. I'm so confused now about which of them is the OG. Well, it's, I think we're supposed to. I mean, to me, in my mind, Mark Spector is always the original because Stephen Grant in the comics was always created by him, but one never knows. Um, I'm confused too. I can't wait to see where it's going to go. You know, um, hope it's good because I am a real fan. I like what they're doing with the character. I really do. Uh, 1.21 Jelly Watts. <laughs> Not Jigawatts, Jelly Watts. Hi, John and or Rob. It's me. One of the first movies I saw to drive in was Jurassic Park, followed by Casper and then Jurassic Park again. It was the most amazing experience and a great way to see Jurassic Park for the first time. 
What is the best drive-in movie you've seen? I will tell you. And I'm going to horribly date myself here. But when we graduated from high school, I'm from a city called Mercer Island, which is between Seattle and Bellevue on Lake Washington. We went to, I think it was the Sunset Drive-In, and we saw a double feature of Rambo First Blood Part Two and The Terminator. And uh, we cooked food, we barbecued, we, we actually took ropes, and people were climbing down the front, like rappelling down the front uh, of the screen while the movie was on. Needless to say, we all got kicked out. But it was so much fun because we just graduated high school. That was probably my most fun drive-in experience, uh, which I love doing. Devin uh, Meenan, Devin Meenan, one of two. Hey, John, I wanted to take this time to say I really appreciate and love all of your shows. Main show, Mailbag, and Movie Club. I respect your personality so much. I like how grounded and straightforward you are. I love being a part of your community. Oh, Devin, that's very nice of you to say. Very sweet. Thank you so much. I mean, I know I'm not John, but I do feel that our, our community is, is a great community and the kind of things that we're trying to cultivate the dialogue between everyone, I think, is really effective. And it's great to hear that you love the channel so much. And I, I will pass that along to John. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. And thanks for supporting the channel. Uh, Devin Meaning goes on. Again, I forgot. It was one of two. Here's his two. Devin, I'm sorry. Two. So thank you so much for your time. Every time you respond to my questions. P.S. I hope to meet you in the crew one day. I live in New York. Uh, is it North Carolina? I live in North Carolina. So I'd love to do a road trip to Cali. Ooh. Never been. Ambulance wasn't too bad. Gyllenhaal was great. Sonic is next. Thoughts on Sonic? Well, I haven't seen Th Sonic, the new one. Everyone else has but me. I'm like the outlier. But I, I'm hoping it's good. You know, I never want a movie to be bad, but it looked fun. The trailer looked fun to me. You know, it looked a little goofy, but it looked fun. So um, I'd love to hear your take. Did you like Sonic? What are your thoughts on it? Put that down in the description and tell me, as John would say, and tell me your thoughts. And by the way, thanks for supporting the channel. Uh, e sends in a tip and says, I don't know, John, if Wanda's kids are in this and stuff, then that means you would have to have had to watch WandaVision to know what's going on, right? Because other than the Infinity War, you said you can jump on board without knowing previous movies. I love the show. Uh, e, I don't believe that. I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe, both the shows and the movies, are designed to be watched all together in a continuum. Sure, you don't have to, and they'll still make sense. But I do believe that they do, in fact, they are all written to be together. I mean, you know, it's all it's all one long storyline. And I think that by watching all of these things, it's more fun. You know? I think so. Um, Roy says, John, I took my seven-year-old to see Sonic 2. And as soon as the Sega title card appeared on screen, I got a wave of emotions because I'm a major movie buff, buff and getting to share this moment with him and seeing my son watch this movie just warms my heart. Well, Roy, that is the power of cinema. Multi-generations, you get to take your son. I mean, my parents knew I loved movies. They were always taking me to movies. It meant a lot to me. It made me the man I am today, whatever that may be. But I really appreciate what my parents were able to do and the fact that they never shied away. And it was a game we played. My parents would be like, well, Rob, you know, uh, if you could get someone else's parents to come pick them, pick you guys up or take you, then, uh, you know, Dad and I will will, will come, we'll, we'll drive one way. And, of course, inevitably or invariably, I don't know, someone's parents, we couldn't get someone else's parents to drive the other way, so I was able to con my parents into taking me both ways, which kind of sucked because um, they knew it was a game, I knew it was a game, and I always kind of felt bad because they were always like, whatever you want, son, and they were like that, but... And my mom's still alive. Um, but, you know, really it was just me. I didn't care if I had friends that wanted to see movies. I'm like, look, man, I need to see this. I'd get, I, would, I would get deliriously excited about movies. And, and they were really a big deal to me. So if I couldn't go, like opening night, I mean, thank God I learned how to use our public transportation system when I was 10. Yes, 10. And we would go all over Seattle. But mostly I wanted to learn how to use the buses so I could go see movies. Because why else? And I love the fact that you're taking your son to the movies. Instill in him a great sense of cinema. Dre B says, hey, John Campia, or J Camp. Yo, J Camp, sup? 
uh, came across Doctor Strange two tickets for a 6 p.m. showing, 6:30 p.m. showing, at the reasonable price of thirty dollars a ticket at the Wheat Regal. Bruh. Well, J Camp, um, that's actually Dre B. Uh, J Camp, why am I not getting it? His name is right there. Dre B. That is from Dre. Dre, 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 Dre I can't even speak. Dre B. Um, well, you scored, bruh. Uh, and six thirty. That'll be. That's still. You know, sometimes in the afternoon, weekend audiences or Friday audiences are getting off work or something. They're tired. But Friday night audiences, or I mean, come on, those are great. Six thirty. You're right after the cusp. There, you should. You should have a great audience. I love that, Dre B. Um, most excellent. And report back. Dre B. Goes on to say, I'm a 28 year old black man. So whenever I tell someone that my favorite TV is of, of all time is The Vampire Diaries, I get laughed at, laugh out loud. What is a show or movie that you unapologetically love that might make someone laugh at you? Well, first of all, um, I would say, you know, when it comes to TV tastes, your favorite TV show, it really doesn't matter whether you're black, white, Indian, Chinese, straight, gay, religious, not religious. All that matters is that you like a story. And you know what? There's no reason why you shouldn't like The Vampire Diaries. Hey, it's a fun show. It's got vampires in it. I'll watch anything with vampires in it. And if it's your favorite show, it's your favorite show. No one can tell you not to like something that you like. Don't ever, ever, ever allow that to happen. And you know, most of the people that I know, um, and I think John knows, would say that was pretty cool that that's your, your favorite show of all time. They would probably laugh, yes, because the initial shock, like some dude... Uh, you say you're a black man, you're 20, you're, you're probably a, a handsome, strapping black man too. And the fact that you have a heart of gold and that you love the Vampire Diaries uh, is, um, that says something. I think that's pretty cool. And uh, don't let anyone tell you what you shouldn't or should or shouldn't love. But to answer the rest of your question, what is a show or movie that you unapologetically love that might make someone laugh at you? Okay, I'm going to say this. I love The Holiday. You know, Kate Winslet, Cameron Diaz. I love the holiday. These girls switch places. I know it's sappy. It's totally a chick flick, whatever. Call it that. Don't get mad. I call it a chick flick. Um, I love the holiday. I love love actually. I'm a sap. I'm a romantic sap. People people think that I just want to watch comic book movies and horror and science fiction. But no, most of my favorite movies are not genre films. You know, I mean, I love Casablanca too. But people, everyone loves Casablanca. But not everyone loves the holiday. So that's probably, that's the first thing that popped into my mind, Dre B. First thing that popped into my mind. I want to thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, Nettie Swats. Nettie Swats. Wow, is this really the last one? I guess this is the last question from Nettie Swats. Nettie Swats says, Hey, Campia crew. John's review of Ambulance can be summarized as Michael Bay got a drone. Well, that's what John said. Well, check out the camera tech YouTuber Potato Jet, who interviews not only cast, but features the 19-year-old drone operator who was hired for those shots. Nettie Swats, that's a great thing to remind people of. Yeah, I, I watched a YouTube video. I don't know if it's the same one, um, but there was a YouTube video that showed using how Michael Bay wanted to use the drone, and they, they hired this 19-year-old drone racer. I mean, drone racing is insane, especially when you can watch... I don't know. I, I my favorite thing is to watch drone racing videos when they're in stadiums, and you you the whole stadium becomes an obstacle course or a racetrack. I love that. The the what they can do with those drones is absolutely astonishing. So I would say yes. Look that up. Uh, I thought I watched that video. I don't know if it's the exact video you're talking about, but I watched a video about piloting drones and 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 Michael Bay using drones on on ambulance in a new way. Count me in. I'm glad you liked it. I mean, I think what a what a cool way to do this. Cool way to make a movie. I mean, if it's I know that John and, and Aaron both said uh Michael Bay got a drone, but hey, there's something to be said for that. So yeah. Um but I'm glad you dug it though. And Nettie Swats, what a great name. I love that name. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to me. Well, everyone, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify across these, the 28 known galaxies, according to Marlon Brando's Jor-El and Superman the movie, I always wondered, why 28 known galaxies? Why not 29? What happened to 30? There's a lot of galaxies out there, but I guess those are all unknown. But anyway, I want to thank you all, all of our lovely viewers from all around the world. I want to thank you so very much for supporting the channel via your tips. 
24 7 seven days a week you can send us whatever's on your mind and if your comments if we deem them appropriate we will read them on mailbag i'm of course your host for this episode that is friday april 8th 2022 robert meyer burnett you can find me on twitter at burnett rm find me on instagram at rm burnett or find me on my own website the post geek it's actually postgeeksingularity.com for daily updates and all kinds of fun stuff or find me on my own YouTube channel The Post Geek Singularity. And on that note, I want to tell everybody, remember, well, I don't need to say it, do I? No, I'll just say, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. This has been Mailbag for the John Campy Show on April 8th, 2022. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am going to continue moving into here. Thanks for spending this time with me, and thanks for supporting the channel.